Chapter 66 to 69. The idea that Allison had killed Mushroom for some unknown reason taunted me for quite some time. It couldn't be over some rude joke or mocking nickname, Mushroom had always avoided angering her, which is the second biggest reason anyone would risk killing Mushroom. I'd briefly dwelt on the idea he'd seen something, overheard some plot, but whatever it was it would have to be big to risk killing him in the Red Keep itself. So I'd set Joffrey to tearing apart his life in response, desperate for some reason Alicent would possibly want him dead and we'd come up with precisely one surprise. Mushroom had been Alicent's creature, spreading her rumors about the court and feeding her every overheard conversation. While that had some chilling implications for Canon Renera, I'd never interacted with him that much and I had never truly trusted the foul-mouthed little demon. He certainly hadn't been privy to anything I hadn't wanted him to be. The discovery of his true allegiance just further muddied the waters. He had been the perfect spy, none suspected him and for all intents and purposes, he gave her some of her most useful information. Even Joffrey and I had not suspected his involvement with her. Why would she kill her own most effective operative? I suppose he could have been getting ready to jump ship but, no that did not make sense. Her greens had started abandoning her after the duel. Mushroom's murder had led to the duel when Cole had been alerted to Cory's existence. I swear the idea that it was Alicent of all people just makes this mystery more infuriating. Despite that ongoing question, the year ended anticlimactically in defiance of all the plots that swirled around the court of King Viserys the Idol. Otto remained moving ever closer to establishing himself as a full-time player in King's Landing once more with his advisory position on the small council. I remained in a holding pattern, making sure my loyal lords felt appreciated in addition to looking for new ones to forge alliances with. And yet despite all that, the Greens and Blacks were hemorrhaging members. Oh, don't get me wrong they were still loyal to their factions, just not as eager to play the game anymore. They had a new game to play, one more violent than court posturing. The clamor for war with Dorne had not died as time had gone on, instead it had grown to a fever pitch as more and more lords nominally joined the Warhawk faction. Viserys was even losing doves. Those that had been focused on Alicent and I's struggle for power were now much more interested in justifying a decisive strike, wishing to complete what Aegon had started. It was so serious that Viserys had even broken his, keep Renera out of government, rule to invite me to the small council meeting on the matter. Father, I said by way of greeting as I arrived to the chamber. Otto was already there, beating even Lyman, brown noser that he was. Renera. His face lit up and he made to hug me, unusually gentle and mindful of my swollen stomach. I kind of missed his bone-crushing hugs actually even if I would never ever say that out loud. Otto gave me a bland smile as I noted he'd stolen my usual seat. Not that it bothered me, I was not about to bicker over a seat. I wasn't that petty. Okay, I totally was but the kids were raising hell and my feet were swollen and I just wanted to sit down. Apparently Viserys was petty enough and turfed Otto from his seat a moment later, indicating I should retake my usual position by his side. That was reassuring. I had feared he would fall into old and comfortable patterns, letting Otto puppet him so he did not have to think about the consequences of his actions. It seemed my father's spine was here to stay. Viserys took my hand as I settled next to him and I gave him a smile in thanks. At least he was trying and who knows, if I failed to spontaneously drop dead in this meeting he might start letting me back into the others. Gods, relying on Corlys was starting to grate. He wasn't bad at his job but he liked to paraphrase and it made my teeth itch. The rest of the council trickled in with only Jeremy showing any real surprise I was present. It really was depressing that the spymaster was the only one who failed to find out I'd be there beforehand. At least he was carrying the documents I'd come to associate with Joffrey and wouldn't be embarrassing the blacks with his incompetence. Welcome, my lords. It is time we discussed Dorne and war. Jeremy, did you complete the task I gave you? Viserys called once we were all seated. Yes, your grace, Jeremy replied and it was the work of the moment not to giggle when I realized he was imitating Joffrey's calm and stoic demeanor as best he could. He began handing out sheets of paper, reports on Dornish troops and politics. Excellent work. Then Viserys turned to us all, serious expression sliding into place. My lords, I have received petition after petition for an attack on Dorne. Something has to be done, a decision has to be made. I have a report on the potential for the civil war we were hoping for, Jeremy told us. Well, get on with it, barked Otto, eyeing him with disgust. Now, Otto, I know this is a personal issue for you but do treat your the counselors with respect. You are not the hand now. You are an advisor, drawled Corlys. Otto went red with rage and prepared to retort. Enough. Jeremy, the report. Viserys barked, 
cutting short the entertainment. Yes, your grace. As you all know the current ruler of Dorne is Princess Aleandra, only two years of age. For a while we had hoped that a civil war would see her struggle with her uncle, Prince Garin, but it seems he has declined to press his suite. Lord Aaron Dane remains Aleandra's regent and is in good standing with most of Dorne. Garin had been the youngest of the late Corrin's brothers, barely out of childhood himself. In response to this, Garin has chosen exile. Or rather, had exile chosen for him by Lord Dane. He has all but fled overseas to the disputed lands with a complement of second sons, bastards and Dornish troops. They have raised a mercenary company named the Sun Spears. Lord Dane was on Bloodstone, was he not? I asked, ignoring the bit about Garin. Mercenary companies came and went like the seasons in the disputed lands, I cared about the man who held Dorne for a toddler. Surprised eyes turned to me. No doubt Viserys was wondering how I knew. I would warrant I'd known before he had given Joffrey was the one who fed Jeremy his carefully curated reports. He was, your grace. He escaped with minor injuries along with Lord Tristane Euler. He beat out the new Lord Walter Will for the regency, Jeremy informed us. It would seem Lord Will holds us responsible for Daemon Targaryen's actions and Lord Dane disagrees with him. Lord Will was a supporter of Prince Garen and reportedly, only just escaped being asked to leave with him. A Will is no easy enemy to have, said Jasper Wilde, face grim. There wasn't anyone in this room who would forget the deeds of Will of Will. The Widow Lover. This Lord Dane may not last long. I have a mind to hope he does. Lord Dane is eager for peace, said Viserys. He has sent a few missives so far. He has offered us Aleandra's hand in marriage for any of my sons or grandsons and her dowry includes a sizable amount of gold and gems. I swallowed down bile. A son as Prince Consort of Dorne or a Dornish Princess as Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. No, as attractive, the idea of drawing Dorne into the Seven Kingdoms peacefully was it would likely destroy the Blacks' chances for alliances in the Stormlands and the Reach. I think I'll turn down that generous offer, I said dryly. I would be better off marrying my future son to a viper I think. The rest of the table chuckled merrily but Otto merely scowled. If your father decides it appropriate, you will do as he says, he snapped. Corlys clenched his fist and got ready to let insults fly. You will mind your tongue, Lord Hightower, Viserys said coldly. My daughter gets first say on who her children marry, just as Alison decides for hers. I apologize, your grace, Otto said quickly, bowing his head. Dorne is in pieces. Corrin did much to buoy its economy but the infrastructure it uses to export its goods has only just begun recovering from the Dornish conquests, I pointed out. It would be ruinous to attack it, difficult to impossible to hold it and would take even more money in investments to make it profitable. Her grace speaks truly, Lyman agreed. I'm only using estimates, you understand, but Dorne has never truly recovered from Queen Visenya and King Aegon's reprisal for the death of Queen Rhaenys. Its income is massively reduced. Further war will only eat into what is left. If we destroy too much we may cause some sort of famine. They've also got a knack for disappearing into those deserts of theirs, observed Corlys with the tone of a man who'd heard of deserts and wanted nothing to do with them. Or caves in the mountains. Be that as it may, said Otto, finding his voice again. The fact remains that the lords of Westeros want this war. It will not be a popular move to block it. I have received multiple petitions myself. I have been receiving them since the day I arrived. Lord Hightower speaks truly, said Jasper. Lord Baratheon and Tyrell are eager for an invasion. Lord Lannister offers his fleet and the Ironborn offer theirs. I'm told there are river lords and Vale men eager for battle as well. The only ones who aren't are the Northmen and nothing gets them out of that frozen hell they call home, sneered Otto. Lord Rickon is old and his son a mere babe. He was also a die-hard northern isolationist for all that his brother, the nerd, pushed for an involvement in southern politics. The Starks still stung over the new gift, over Walton Stark. Everything Alaric, Edric, Ellard and finally Rickon had done since had only reinforced that quiet anger, reinforced the separation from Westeros at large. If they must get involved they would do so as little as they could get away with and they would complain about it the entire time. No wonder they'd been an afterthought in the original dance. Viserys let out an annoyed breath and massaged at his temples. Finally, he looked up. Can the Iron Throne afford this war, Lord Beesbury? he asked. Lyman pursed his lips. At present, no. At the aghast looks, he continued a little hastily. Winter swiftly comes. 
Spending always spikes during this period and income always falls. After winter then, asked Otto, leaning forward with an eager expression on his face. If we can reinforce the treasury, perhaps ask for some donations towards a war fund, we could invade once winter is over. If the will for war is still there, I said. It may well wither and die as the winds of winter blow. Damn it. Damn it all. If this war for Dorn kicks off it'll set us my blacks back years. My daughter speaks correctly, said Viserys and my heart jumped in delight only to drop a few moments later. But so does Lord Otto. We all waited in silence as the king thought through the best responses. If he said yes, it would be the black dragons on the front line. Lena, Laner, and Rainey's for certain. Yet if he said no, he would be leaving himself open to political turmoil in the form of the marcher lords going wild. Damn Otto for stirring this up. Should the will for war with Dorne still exist after winter has passed, we shall launch an invasion of Dorne, decreed the king and my fingers gave a painful jolt as they curled into fists. There was a note of finality in his voice, his face grim. I could understand why. I did miss Otto's victorious smile. He had his promise of war, all he needed to do now was stoke the flames through winter. Moving his assassination forward would be unwise, and yet I wanted to. He was dangerous, he was running rings around me. Damn him. Viserys called for me to stay as the rest trooped out. I forced a smile. I needed to get to my people, needed to discuss how we would counter these calls for war. Yet when the king called, I had to answer. How goes your attempts to put together a household for the twins? Viserys asked once we were alone. I restrained a sigh at the question but just barely. It was beyond frustrating. I was expected to find nursemaids, maids, stewards, knights, ladies and tutors all before they had even left my body. My own household numbered nearly 200, most of which were back at Dragonstone, and Viserys seemed to be under the impression that I would need half of that again to manage the twins. Not to mention the current argument going on between Viserys and Rainies about nursemaids in general. Rainies was still adamant I should feed them myself as she had and Lena had. Viserys argued otherwise. Emma hadn't, Alicent hadn't, Alyssa hadn't, honestly it was getting quite heated and I really couldn't tell who was in the right. I'd asked Lena to look into it for me, I'd written up a fancy proclamation she should be allowed access to any book on Dragonstone she so wished and then pointed her at our ancestral home. I had been told by Joffrey she'd been gone a day and returned with every half-mangled dragon manual she had been able to find. Well, at least her high Valyrian is bound to improve. Despite the bickering over who was feeding the kids, the household was a delicate thing. A role serving the newborn babes would be considered an honor, no matter how small the babes were. I charitably overlooked the fact it would bring much prestige and opportunities with it. No one was going to be taking advantage of my kids, not unless they wanted to meet Syrax up close and personal. Still, as much as I wanted to tear my hair out over the whole thing, I had to take it seriously. Well enough. I have a few maids being trained up by Alanis so they can respond to emergencies. I have some loyal Dragonstone men and women being shipped over. He frowned and I sighed. I have not decided on a noble compliment for them yet. You must consider it soon be they boys or girls. His face softened when he saw my scowl and he drew me into another delicate hug. I'm proud of you my girl. So proud. I let myself return the hug, pulling comfort from him in a way I never usually did when he started with the hugging. How is young Luceris? he asked when we pulled apart. Well enough. A normal baby. He has quite the set of lungs on him, I reported. Viserys smiled sadly. I know I never did right by Damon but I can do right by Luceris. If he ever needs anything you tell Lady Lena to come to me. I winced. Yes, I will absolutely tell her, I said, being very careful not to tense up and then relax. Viserys gave me another sad smile. How is, how is your young man? Oh, he's trying for fatherly again. Well enough. Quarreling with his sister at the moment over dragon formations. I think Rainey's is ready to feed them both to Malays and have done with it. Viserys chuckled nervously at that and I smiled in amusement. Like Joffrey, Rainey's still made him nervous. Is that usual? I mean, do the Valerians often quarrel? He asked eventually. I couldn't help it, I threw my head back and laughed until my sides hurt. Oh gods, it comes to them as easy as breathing. All of them could be excellent mummers. I think you dodged the proverbial arrow when you failed to marry Lena. He gave me a pained smile and his patented, kicked puppy look and I sighed, my own amusement fading. Father. I love them all dearly. 
I would not give them up for the world but that does not mean I think any less of you. If Corlys and Rhaenys were my true parents I'd have run away to ETI years ago. I only felt a little guilty that I was hiding the truth from him. For all that he genuinely tried, I struggled to love this man as a father. I struggled to see him as my family. Telling him that would break him asunder and so I smiled happily as he beamed at me and said nothing. Like the Starks are fond of warning us, winter had come. The White Ravens from the Citadel going out to inform everyone that the three-year summer we had enjoyed was over. The once pleasant heat of King's Landing gave way to a slight chill and I got to enjoy more fires and cocooning myself in blankets. Even if the sudden change in temperature made my fingers ache terribly. In the Vale, the mountain clans were in disarray. Jane had stopped the Falcons from chasing them into the mountains despite Lord Dennis' desire to take the fight to them. Instead she'd ordered them to patrol, to prevent their usual raiding for food and supplies. With winter bringing freezing winds and snows to the Vale now, the mountain clans looked to be in for a harsh time. I learnt all of this after the fact, Rhea giving the report in an amused voice. She has forgiven you but that does not mean she will not try and make you suffer for it, the Lady of Runestone told me as we relaxed by the fire. She wants revenge for my teasing about Maris, I said, well aware Maris was sitting within earshot. The Grafton snorted oddly and a glance told me she'd just inhaled her juice, much the Sarah's amusement. Then she gave me a look of warning, I smiled sweetly in turn and returned to my aunt. Speaking of marriages. I note a handsome young man has been paying court to you. My aunt, all of three and thirty years, blushed like a maiden. I threw my head back and laughed in delight at the sight. I should not be surprised you noted that, she muttered sourly, face still flushed after I'd calmed down. I am taking my time. I understand why but Torin Mandoli seems a charming man. The fact that he was young enough to be her son went unsaid, even if it was muttered about at court. The Mandolies wanted to make clear that they would not be rallying to the deposed Graftons and they were doing so by literally courting Jane's principal bannerman. Not that Rhea did not want to be courted by the dashing second son. He had yet to gain the weight he would later on in life and was well-spoken and polite. He is charming, well-mannered and clever besides, she admitted, a small smile growing on her face. I had worried about his suit initially, finding out if he had been serious regarding it had been Mara's first real assignment as a spy. He was, as far as we could tell. He was genuinely fond of Rhea despite her age and whilst he was eager to call himself a lord he was happy to do so as a Royce and not a Mandalay. I hadn't told Rhea I'd had her love interest stalked but it was nice to know for sure. She'd kill me if she thought I was worrying about her. I am happy for you. Regardless, has Jane spoke to you about marriage? For all that our correspondence has resumed normalcy this past month or so, she has not mentioned it. I was well aware pushing the issue with Jane would get me back in her bad books but Rhea and Jane's relationship had grown into one of mutual fond exasperation. As a result, Jane was sometimes freer with information than she was with me. I do not bring up the topic. It is a sore one, Rhea told me. I fear it will just bring to mind old fears of hers. Old nightmares. The letter I sent on your behalf. I fear she will not be as quick to forgive me as she did you. Ah, Willem. Being asked about marriage by his sister must bring it all back. We lapsed into silence for a while, listening to the background chatter of Maris attempting to draw Sarah into a card game and Sarah showing good sense for once and refusing. Rhea smiled softly to herself and I found myself dozing in the peace that followed. It all seemed so domestic, so warm, that not even the fear of the children's coming could touch me. Not even fear of Otto, not even here a month for all that it seemed like he'd been here an age. He was still on his best behavior but Joffrey had predicted that. Corlys had become more interested in Joffrey's work now. Something told me that if Maris was to be Joffrey's first partner in crime, Corlys would be his second. Not that Maris was involved in the scheming. She ran the rapidly multiplying gambling dens, her job being to filch as much information from her patrons as humanly possible. That Joffrey was thinking of handing her the brothel spoke well of her. I trusted his judgment of people. It would also free up a lot of Joffrey's time and give him a break from sifting through the proverbial crap for the odd diamond. She seems fond of your sister, Rhea said finally and I forced my eyes open with a yawn in response. Jane that is. She says Helena is a delight but something of a handful. Jane had written something similar to me in her letters. Helena wrote of missing home and missing her siblings and parents. She liked the sights though and Morgul liked the mountains. The fact that Jane allowed her to keep practicing her bow was another bonus. That girl was going to be a terror with a bow when she actually reached an age to have a proper one. 
Helena could win anyone's heart, I said, blinking sleep from my eyes. Had I actually dozed off? Another yawn caused my jaw to crack. She does complain frequently of housing Morgul though. I smiled. If the Airy had not been built for dragons then the Gate of the Moon were even worse. Morgul was still small enough to fit in the courtyards but that presented a whole different set of problems. She would only continue to get larger with the whole of the Vale to traverse and no pit to keep her in. Jane was already fielding complaining shepherds and goat herders. Viserys had promised a royal allowance to both the Vale and the Westerlands to pay for dragon-related incidents. Speaking of which, Aegon had actually written to me directly. Not just a few lines in his usual letters to Viserys and Alicent but to me. If he was to be believed, Frost had undergone a similar growth spurt to Morgul and he was curious about why. I doubt my reply had even reached him yet but combined with Alicent's declining greens and Otto's upcoming death, well, the dance was looking less and less likely. Dragons are certainly not easy mounts to train and control, I said diplomatically. I'm given to believe you barely house your own in the pit anymore. Rhea said although it was more a question that statement. It was not strictly true. As my pregnancy developed Syrax was rapidly becoming my refuge as everyone and their mother crowded me day and night, attempting to wrap me in more and more cotton wool. In the sky, I could escape everyone but Rainies and her children. Rainies approved of the practice I was getting in. Lena and Laner had both tried to object, worried about the twins, and I had gleefully thrown Lena's own late pregnancy riding right back at them. With Rainies backing me up, they had no choice but to let me fly. Not that it stopped them arranging a schedule as to who would be following me up and when. The increased time in the air had seen me claim a stretch of abandoned beach for Syrax to nap on. Whilst the surrounding livestock farmers and fishers no doubt hated her, it was easier than the spectacle of the dragon pit over and over again. I pay for the food she hunts, I mumbled, feeling a little guilty. I actually paid above market price, it seemed appropriate. So you do, murmured Rhea, smiling. I will depart, niece. I have lords to corral and you can barely keep your eyes open. You do not need to. I protested as she rose and I struggled out of my chair to follow her. I am quite able to remain awake. She drew me into a hug. She'd become much better at giving them recently, considerably less elbow than the first few I had received from her. Go to sleep. I do remember lecturing you about invincibility. I do not need a repeat of runestone, especially when you are pregnant. Then she swept off and I dropped back into my seat and sighed, trying to shake of the exhaustion I felt. Are you feeling well, Renera? asked Sarah, moving around the chairs so I could see her. If you are tired or feeling ill no one would criticize you if you took to bed now. I can cancel your meal with the Valerians for you. Yet it would bring judgment regardless, I said and stood up once more, Sarah standing by to help. I may well rule one day whilst pregnant. I cannot be useless for nine months if such a thing should happen. And tonight was the night I would tell Lena everything. She had not asked again or pushed the matter since but oh, how I wanted to tell her, to have no secrets between us. Don't be so boneheaded. Cancel the meal and sleep, Maris said hotly. Else I shall tell Sir Joffrey and he shall set Lady Lena on you. Lady Lena does not scare me, I declared, visions of enforced trout dancing across my mind's eye. If Lena thought I was dodging needed sleep she'd chain me to the bed. Perhaps a compromise and we can have the meal here. Does she not? Normally threats such as that work. After all, Jane is terribly susceptible to that same threat in regards to Jessamine Redfort. I felt the blood drain from my face at that, hand finding the back of the chair. Oh gods, how long had she known? Sarah, could you go and inform Sir Laner, Sir Joffrey and Lady Lena to attend on her grace here tonight? The strong bustled off, looking worriedly at my pale face. I waited until she was long gone before turning back to Maris. How long dash, I started but she cut me off with a wave of her hand. Oh, since you two started I'd warrant. I didn't care when it was Jane and certainly do not care when it's you. I think it goes without saying that others would not be so forgiving though. Breath came a little easier at that and she guided me into my seat and brought me some juice to sip at. You need not fret so much. Sir Joffrey has already taken me to task on it. Is that so? I asked, dazed, as she pushed the cup towards my mouth. Maria and Felena are the ones you want to watch out for, Maris said after a while. To caught up in their faith, they'll expose you in a heartbeat regardless of the goodwill you have built with them. I'm not sure about the strongs, they're harder to get a read on. I nodded and continued sipping my juice, heart still pounding in my chest. I'll run interference for you, of course. 
Jane would sulk if I failed to help along such a love story, Maris finished and a moment later Sarah returned. I sent a runner to the manse, she told us. Do you need the maester, Renera? No. No, it is fatigue. I just need good company and then some sleep, I hastily assured her and she smiled. Very well then. Should I call a maid for dinner to be taken here? I nodded. Tell them to bring meals for you and Maris as well, I said, regaining something approaching equilibrium. Gods, how I wish Joffrey would tell me when he'd picked up on things like this. Words would be had. I would not have you both starve because I failed to make my appointments. Oh. Can we break into your liqueur collection? Sarah asked, shooting a covetous glance past me. I glanced at said collection and then shrugged. I'd not drunk in any great amount since I'd found out. The gifts had been checked thoroughly by the king's guard and then stacked into the cabinet for decoration mostly. If you so wish. Sarah gave a squeal of happiness and began poking through the bottles. Eventually Maris meandered over, drawn by some of the more expensive drinks from Eastern Essos. They'd settled on a type of pear liqueur when Lena entered with Laner on her heels, both looking beyond worried. Joffrey hobbled in soon after as they fussed over me. The winter air had the same effect on his leg as it did on my fingers. Laner was all for him never leaving his offices in the manse and the large fire they boasted but Joffrey had put an end to being babed with aplomb. I wish I had that skill. I'm fine, just tired and wishing for company, I said, derailing Lena and Laner's questions. I thought it might be something like that but you know how those two are, Joffrey told me, sitting down opposite and stretching his leg out. Lena snorted and rose to go to his side, falling into Laner's usual pattern of massaging the broken limb. I caught Laner's eye but there was no jealousy there. That was something at least. Instead, my husband dropped his head onto my stomach, pressing his ear to fabric as if he sought to listen for its occupants, and smiled shyly at me. I returned it happily as Maris and Sarah began pouring out some of the drink for everyone but me and passed it around. To Princess Renera, called Sarah. Our future queen. The rest followed toasted along with her and I raised an eyebrow. That was brown-nosing I'd expect from Otto Hightower. What? She said in response to my questioning look. This is Alice and I's favorite drink. Do you know how expensive it is? Father only lets Alice and I have one small glass about once a year. It's very expensive. Which is why you should never let Alice at it, Renera, Joffrey told me from his own seat as Laner donated his own glass to Sarah with a screwed up face. Evidently not a fan. He laid his head back on my stomach and two seconds later the kids started their usual nighttime party. Startled, Laner drew his head back. Was that, he trailed off, hopeful look on his face. I smiled and drew his hand down to where they kicked out once more. Tears sprang to his eyes as his hands roamed over my stomach. Then he giggled like a maiden receiving her first kiss. Hello, little ones, he choked through his tears then dropped his face low to my belly. I'm your father. I was awoken the next morning to Sarah's pained groaning as she shielded her eyes from the sun that streamed through the not quite drawn curtains. I pushed myself up, trying my best to ignore the kids and looked at her with some concern. I should not have drunk so much last night, she said finally becoming aware of my gaze. I feel awful. I had not thought you had drank so much. I said, bemused. She had finished her own and Laner's pear liqueur and had partaken in a few cups of wine alongside the rest of us, bar me and my juice, but, well, my lady's own drinking habits had declined with my own. Alice was the binge drinker of the strong family, Sarah had probably lost a great deal of her tolerance. No doubt her sister would work to remedy that after the babes were born. She groaned again and I fought a chuckle, swinging myself over to pull the bell cord. A maid appeared a moment later and was dispatched to retrieve a volunteer replacement for Sarah. I was due to have Alice and Felena today, perhaps one of them might make their way over early. When I am clothed you may use my bed to sleep off your hangover in. I will have some water and food sent to you. When she opened her mouth to protest I raised a hand. Sleep, Sarah. Thank you, Renera. Truly you are the mother reborn, she whimpered, hands covering her eyes again. I smiled and leant back into the pillows, enjoying the feeling of the twins moving about as they were wont to do in the hours after I awoke. Laner had finally felt them. That left me smiling widely for some reason I couldn't quite put my finger on. The usual chill of fear the morning brought seemed so distant as I lay cocooned in my blankets, stroking my stomach. Felena turned up a moment later, covering the ground from my lady's room to mine so fast I wondered if she had access to Littlefinger's teleporter. 
She tooted in disapproval at the groaning Sarah but helped me dress with only a few acidic comments. Then, without my prompting, helped the strong girl into my bed without complaint. We left my old friend the chamber pot nearby as well as the water and bread we had requested and she thanked us profusely for it. Sots, the both of them, Felena growled as I seated myself for my own breakfast. Alice was drunk herself last night. What she does in her off hours is no business of mine, Felena. Besides, Sarah's predicament is my fault. Felena said nothing in response to that but gave me her usual raised eyebrow of silent disapproval. How goes Septon Patrick's work with the charity? Her demeanor changed in an instant and she beamed. Oh very well. Your excess food from the test farms have worked excellently in supplying some of our worst supplied food banks and kitchens. Septon Patrick cannot stop singing your praises, she said. I know you still have your reservations but allow me to assure you he only cares for fighting the corrupt faith. Surprisingly, that reassurance meant something to me. Felena was an astute judge of character in the way only Lena was amongst my ladies. Maria was too inclined to fall for a sob story, Maris too cynical and the Strongs too naive. It is very easy to turn that to criticisms of the nobility. Might I remind you there are as many corrupt nobles, eager to exploit the small folk, as there are corrupt septons? I said and Felena nodded. I have brought similar worries to the septon myself although about those who do not follow the seven. Lord Redfort is a great ally and friend of my father and yet the Redfort boasts a god's wood, she explained. I would not see the faith attack him for that nor would I see them cause issues elsewhere in Westeros. And what did the Septon say to your worries? I asked, taking a bite of the little fishes wrapped in bacon. He said that the Seven must be spread through learning, understanding and love for our fellow man for we are all children of the Seven, she said proudly. I smiled without really feeling it. It seemed too good to be true, a Septon whose ideals aligned with mine perfectly, who did not desire the faith militant or political power. He said that having blades at its back only encouraged the High Septon to act as a king would. He thinks King Jaehaerys did not go far enough when he banned the warrior's sons and the poor fellows, Felena continued. He thinks he should have rebuilt the faith, changed it from the High Septon downward. He has been working on his manifesto. Septon Patrek was a fanatic but a clever one. The best I could hope for is that he would use me, I would use him and our goals would never wildly diverge. Still, the men I had posted to him agreed with Felena so far. It did not mean he was not hiding his desire for power but it spoke well of him. I would wait and watch him. When I knew what made him tick, what he truly wanted, then I would sleep easier at night. Perhaps a lighter topic to eat breakfast over? I suggested and Felena nodded in turn. My sister's name day approaches and I have yet to find her an acceptable gift. Something archery related is bound to impress her, drawled Felena, amused. But there are other options she may enjoy. When she was at Dragonstone with us she seemed fond of tales about adventures. Helena did like stories. And I do have a good father who knows an adventure story or two, I murmured in thought. Not that Corlys hadn't storied Helena's ear off about his adventures already but hiring a scribe and artist to set them to paper with illustrations might be nice gift and if I ever managed to get paper and ink manufacturing up and running it might prove a popular book to sell. Yes, I think I shall bother Lord Corlys for his stories once more, I said with a nod at my lady. Lord Corlys does not need bothering much to launch into a recount of his brave adventures. The true comedy occurs when Lady Rainies seeks to correct him, Felena chuckled and my smile grew to match hers. A maid entered and bowed low before announcing the arrival of Laner, still glad in his training gear. A part of my brain was drooling at the sight of him. Good morning, Renera, he said cheerfully before dropping to his knee. And good morning twins. They were silent in the face of his greeting. They've gone shy, I told him and he beamed at me before standing up again. What brings you to my room so early? You might well have stayed the night and saved Sarah the fallout from her hangover. Lena and Joff are hungover as well. Joffrey decided working on the mushroom conundrum would be soothing and Lena has declared herself your master of dragons. Both of them have sealed their office to me, his smile was rueful and I suspected he'd been locked out more to his exuberance exacerbating their headaches rather than any particular bad feelings on their part. Well, it's nice to see Lena is enjoying the duty I set her, I said, amused as Laner dropped into one of the couches with a sigh. She enlisted mother's help as well. Might I bathe here, Renera? I still have my chest in your rooms, yes? I tried to cover my amusement at how full of beans he seemed today but couldn't quite. Felena seemed to be struggling as well. This was pure Laner, not the mask of Prince Consort he often had in place. Dork. 
Felena had the maids heat some water for a bath and we sent him off into my bathing room with a change of clothes from his chest. Felena and I relaxed in front of the fire, her resorting to stitching and myself reading a book I'd received as a gift a month or so ago at that fateful tournament. It wasn't particularly interesting but it did pass the time well enough that it didn't feel like an age before Lena emerged, clean and dressed. Felena, could I prevail on you to leave me with my husband this morning? Perhaps go and remind Alice she was supposed to be here quite some time ago. She drew herself up at that and I mentally apologized to Alice Strong. Lena took Felena's vacated seat with an amused smile on his face. That was cruel, he said and I pulled a face at him. She would have loomed over both our shoulders all day, I complained. I have nightmares about that disapproving sniff she has. He laughed at that although not before a pained expression flickered over his own fine features. Felena was well aware of Laner's ill-done dalliance with John Harding. She had to suspect Corey had also been telling the truth. The duel had proved before the eyes of the seven that Laner was not in the wrong but I suspected her grudging silence had more to do with the horrendous double standard between men and women in Westeros than any particular loyalty to him. How goes Joffrey's search for our mysterious friend? I asked after we'd finished chuckling. Laner pulled a face in response. I haven't said this to him because it seems to me to be a bit unsettling but he seemed to struggle with his words for a moment. It seems to me this friend is, well, courting him. Courting him, I repeated, disbelief entering my tone. Laner squirmed in his seat before shrugging. His friend makes comes up with some scheme, forcing him to respond. Then he prepares some other scheme in reprisal and his friend effortlessly avoids it. Until recently they never actually damaged one another in this game, they would simply come close, acknowledge the damage they might have done and let it drop. He scratched at his chin, embarrassed. It seems to me it's more about ensuring Joff sees him than a battle for control of King's Landing. So you think Allison's factor is, trying to get Joffrey's attention? Would this not imply he thinks Joffrey knows who he is? That he would know who Joffrey is? I asked. As oddly as Laner phrased it, it did contain a smidgen of sense. I do not know. If Alicent knew who Joffrey was she'd want him dead, whether he held the esteem of her own spymaster or not. I have warned him about such several times, Laner said sourly. I worry for him. Miseria's influence has left the city but this friend of his was able to snatch as much of her people as he was. Joffrey is well capable of holding his own, I said and he nodded, miserable. But, you might be onto something there. Whatever had begun niggling at me the moment Laner had finished his theory danced annoyingly out of reach and yet I felt it was just on the tip of my tongue that one more bridge of logic would take me to a realization that would help Joffrey in his dance with Alicent's man. That he is danger, said Laner. I closed my eyes and shook my head. No, I murmured. No, something you said has my thoughts racing but, they refuse to tell me what has them in such a state. Laner hummed in thought and the creak of the chair told me he'd settled back himself. I pored over what Laner had said. Alicent's spymaster had seemed to flirt with Joffrey. It may not actually imply he knew who he was, just that he had seen his effects on the city. Joffrey had said it started after he'd purchased more than a few brothels and knocked out a few low-hanging greens. So our friend had seen that and liked his style, bringing his own spy ring to bear in response. Which implies that up until that point he didn't have it or if he did he was not so invested in it, so had Alicent found him as he'd played with Joffrey? Or had he found Alicent when he realized Joffrey had me? Which would explain? Oh, I breathed, eyes snapping open. Understanding flowed through me like a freight train. Laner get me some paper, I need to write this down. He hastened to obey and soon we were both bent low over it as I put ink to paper. I think our friend started his own spying before Joffrey but not, as we thought, as Alicent's agent. I think he found Joffrey later, initiated this game as a way to impress him, to spur him on. I started. I think Alicent came later after he realized Joffrey was my factor. I don't think he actually knows who Joffrey really is, I think he just likes his style. I don't even know if our friend would tell Alicent because I don't think he's hers. You think they are merely allies? Laner said, picking up and I nodded. Allies and uneasy ones to boot. I don't think Alicent killed Mushroom, Laner. I think our friend was creating his own job opening. He kills Mushroom, makes himself Joffrey's counterpart in the greens. He is courting him, said Laner, frowning. Which means soon enough, I think he'll reveal himself whether we unmask him or not. That realization had Joffrey scrambling for the information he'd collected on Mushroom once more. He was determined not be blindsided if our theory proved correct. 
It was also somewhat hilarious to see Laner's outright offense that someone would court the man he loved when they would have to know the truth regarding the two men. Although, given the ongoing power struggle between Otto and Alicent, I had to wonder if Joffrey's friend would remain Alicent's for much longer. A spymaster with that kind of skill and resources at Otto's beck and call would be a dangerous thing indeed. I was starting to suspect Joffrey was right, that bringing Otto to court where there was enough political upheaval for him to take advantage of was a horrendous idea. Okay, I know Joffrey was right. I was wrong and Joffrey was right. But now that Otto was here he had to die before he managed to salvage the Greens entirely. No doubt this war for Dorne was his grand plan. Already he was revealing his hand with the plans he was drawing up for the invasion and its aftermath. He was advising Viserys to appoint several Stormlanders and Reachman as governors to prevent further rebellion. I was no expert on Dorne, as he was fond of repeating to all and sundry, but that seemed like a bad idea to me. He'd picked marcher lords like the Peaks and the Swans, lords with grudges who would be happy to avenge a thousand years of raiding and skirmishes on the innocent and vulnerable. If he had his way, Dorne would be bathed in blood for generations. Take him away, Lena. He is making too much noise, I hissed into my pillow, twisting the covers over my head as the sound of Lucerys rolling his egg about drove spikes of pain through my skull. Time marched on despite my renewed desperation that it should not. The third trimester loomed large and my sickness returned with a vengeance, intent on punishing me for getting comfortable. My weight gain continued its steady siege on my good looks despite both Laner and Lena assuring me I was still the realm's delight. It was hard to feel that way when I had gained the start of a second chin. If the sickness ruined my day, the the twins ruined my night. If they did quiet down sleep was slow to come and not especially restful. I frequently awoke in the morning drained and empty. My entire body seemed to ache in pain with the effort of holding the babes that grew within me and part of me was starting to hate them, hate Laner and hate the society that was forcing me to carry them. Exhaustion, sickness and hormones created a potent cocktail and my mood became black. In one moment I would snap vicious insults at my ladies, my husband or my good family and in others the guilt would bring storms of tears and self-hatred. Otto and Alicent capitalized on it with glee, spreading rumors of my rages and my difficulties. Most of their stories seemed designed to give the impression that I would die in childbirth like my mother before me and if I did so it would be the punishment of the mother for my midwives. He is a babe and you agree to have him in here for the price of having me, she replied, tone verging on waspish. Then she sighed, pried the covers off of me, chivied me into a sitting position and laid a hand on my stomach. The children kicked out joyfully in response to my movement and she smiled, then dropped a kiss to my lips. You will be fine. This is the worst part and then you will have two babes in your life. No one will ask for another heir for a long time, she murmured, breath hot on my ear. Then she retrieved Lucerys and his egg from the floor and settled him between us, curling around him and into my side with a satisfied smile. Two years. I do not care if they are boys or girls I'm not having another for at least two years. Longer if I can manage it, I groused as Lucerys slapped at his egg happily and then drooled on it. She stroked at my hair, unbound after I had been ordered to bed by Girardis. When I remained unmoved she pulled me close and laid her head on my shoulder. I smiled, even after all this time she still smelt of dragon and sea salt. No one shall demand. I shall set mother on them if they do. A threat that would work on even Viserys I thought with a smile then I grimaced as my headache decided I was not allowed a moment of peace and flared up again. If my next pregnancy is as bad as this one I'll never have another, I whimpered, covering my eyes once more. Nausea swirled in my gut and I forced my jaw to clench tightly. Lena would not appreciate me throwing up on her or her child. Joffrey says I am to distract you when you're like this, Lena said, poking at my cheek. She was trying for an impish smile but I could see the worry in her eyes. The sudden return and worsening of my sickness and symptoms had everyone scrambling. The subsequent babying and enforced bed rest had not helped my mood. Something told me that if I threw a tantrum when Lucerys was in the room she wouldn't speak to me for weeks though. Joffrey is interfering again, I mumbled and lay down. My change his position sent Lucerys sprawling in the sheets, flailing as the pillow he had been propped up against shifted. His egg went in the opposite direction, rolling towards the end of the bed and prompting his face to screw up in grief and fear. Lena scooped him up and hushed him, rocking him back and forth. Thankfully, he never started wailing and instead stuck to little sobs which soon died. Ah, she said. He's gone to sleep. Is that such a problem? I asked, trying to poke his egg back towards us with my feet. He won't sleep later but perhaps I should put you both down for a rest now. 
I raised my eyebrow at that as she laid him next to me. The egg bumped his toes a moment later and she scooped it over, placing it next to him. His small pudgy hand came to rest on it and I sighed, rolling onto my back. My stomach was a flutter with fear again and I brought my hands to rest on it, chewing my lip without meaning to. Go to sleep, Lena said finally. I will be here when you awaken. Perhaps, I shall even secure you some treats. That's bribery, I muttered, mind going to the potential treats she could get me. Nothing too sweet or anything with a powerful taste which ruled out my usual fare but she had persuaded the owner of the bakery near the manse to experiment a little to produce things I liked. I am quite confident it will work, she said, dropping her head to kiss my temple. I smiled in response and let my eyes flutter closed. You have been brave recently. I like it, I told her and she laughed in response. I have kissed you and the world has not ended. You have not sent me away, she whispered. And Joffrey has a way of getting through your thick head, I mumbled and she scoffed in mock offense before her hands found my hair. I will admit to enduring more than a few of his lectures even before I decided to be brave, as you put it. A yawn was her answer as I snuggled deeper into the sheets and she huffed in laughter again. When I awoke, she was gone. Lucerys was still here, curled up next to me, so she'd likely just stepped out or gone to deal with something. Unfortunately, I awoke said child as I pushed myself into a sitting position and was forced to prop him up against me as he wobbled about trying to roll over. Then I had to chase the escaped egg, still warm from both our bodies, across the sheets and return it to him. He wrapped his arms about it and laid a still sleepy cheek against it. Me and you both, buddy, me and you both. A nap had done wonders for my mood, I reflected as I smiled against my own will, had I been left alone with Lucerys before said nap I'd have likely sulked about it for at least an hour. The worst thing was that I knew when I was being unreasonable. I knew it was unfair to take it out on everyone else and yet I did so anyway. Only for the guilt later to drive me to distraction and frequently tears. The next time I get pregnant something tells me my ladies will resign on the spot. An odd scratching sound drew me from my thoughts and my eyes found the door. It remained unopened and besides it was unlocked. One of the castle cats maybe. But they so rarely came to private rooms, they'd long since learned they'd be chased away. My heart sped up a bit as I twisted round to look at the window. It was covered by heavy curtains but we were quite far up so that was an unlikely source as well. Then Lucerys let out a frightened sob and my eyes drifted down to him and his egg. His egg that boasted a spider web of cracks. The cracks that were spreading, slowly but surely as the contents of the egg struggled to freedom. I lifted him gently away from it, heart pounding fast and settled him on my knee before rolling the egg a little further away. Lucerys' frightened sobbing stopped as a wing pushed its way through the egg and into the air only to vanish into the egg again. A dragon, I said to him, feeling a little stupid for saying something so obvious. It will be yours. Your birthright. He seemed transfixed as a dark red head of a hatchling pushed its way through the gap, the rest of the body trying to follow. When it got stuck, it snapped its wings out again, shattering what was left of its confines across my sheets and bedding. Much to my annoyance, a great deal of egg goop followed. The hatchling let out that strange gargling screech I'd come to associate with younger dragons and crawled forward, smearing the unnamed goop around it. It was pretty enough for a dragon. Dark red, verging on burgundy in color. Its horns and eyes were darker still, almost black yet I could just make out the red tint to it in the light of the flames that lit my room. Its eyes and head bobbed about and fixed upon the babe in my lap. Lucerys reached out with his pudgy hands and the tiny dragon's tongue darted out across his knuckles at the before rearing back from the excited flailing with another surprised gargle. Lucerys laughed and slapped his hands together and the dragon settled on nibbling on Lucerys' foot, much to my own heart-stopping terror. My heart ceased trying to beat its way from my chest somewhat when it failed to draw blood and Lucerys did not indicate pain. Lena is going to kill me when she realizes she missed this, I told Lucerys as his happy giggling rose in pitch again. This was early for an egg to hatch, she likely hadn't even given thought that it might when she'd nipped off to run whatever errand she'd gone on. Normally, they hatched between six months and a year. A year and half would be the absolute cutoff, the deadline for removing the egg from the child. There seemed to be no rhyme or reason as to which egg would hatch for who. Laner's egg, once belonging to Rainey's, had hatched giving him his beloved sea smoke yet Lena's had not and she had later tamed the mighty Vagger. Rainey's had tried oh so hard to hatch the egg her son had, using every method she could lay her hands on apparently, refusing to give it up until she had exhausted every avenue only then had she given up and mounted malaise. 
Eamon, her father, had hatched Karaxes and spent many years shying from it yet it had remained true only to him despite his rejections. This is why Lena's work would be invaluable. The work she did here might be more valuable to House Targaryen than my own rule, I realized with wide eyes. The dragon continued his destruction of my sheets, claws cutting wide gashes in the fabric and Lucerys watched, completely enraptured by his new dragon. Taking care to not disturb them, I leant across and pulled the bell pull. Moments later, the door was opened by a maid who quite impressively got through half her usual niceties before noticing the real-life dragon destroying my bedding and trailed off with a frightened squeak. Perhaps you can find Lady Lena and a platter of charred meat for me, I suggested, as she stared pale-faced at the newborn. She nodded and fled, leaving the door wide open. I snorted. Something told me she might be tendering her resignation soon. From my lap, Lucerys giggled once more as the dragon made its way to end of the bed and nearly toppled over the edge. Is that Lucerys I hear giggling? Came Lena's cheerful voice from somewhere out of sight. Is your Auntie Ray taunting you again? It was all I could to contain my own giggling when she stepped into the room and stopped dead, eyes wide as she took in the destruction and the dragon. Surprise! I called cheerfully as her startled face turned to me for an explanation. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.